Well, I trust the words of those songs minister to your hearts today. I was thinking about a number of folks in our church who are just going through hard things, losing loved ones to death and cancer returning and dealing with other sorts of uh, diseases and sicknesses and financial crises, maybe marital challenges, kid problems, um, you name it. It seems like there's always something going on in our lives or at least in the lives of those around us in a local body of believers like this. And so that's why it's so good for us to come together and let the word of Christ richly dwell within us as we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And um, well, now we have the distinct opportunity to open the word of God and have God speak to us. And I want to encourage you to take your Bibles and turn back to the passage that we began looking at last Sunday, 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at verse, verses 18 through 22 this morning, 1 Peter chapter 3, let's begin reading in verse 18, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience." Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Holy Spirit, I am particularly aware this morning of how desperately dependent I am and we all are for you to enlighten our minds to understand what is in this passage and to enliven our hearts to feel what is in this passage and also to enable our hands and our feet to do and apply what is in this passage. Thank you for our triumphant Savior, Jesus Christ, who we get to look at again today. And I pray that our hearts would be exhilarated as we consider what Christ has done and what he is continuing to do on our behalf. We pray this in his name. Amen. Well, as you know, this is not the only letter that Peter wrote. In his second letter, he made the following comment about the letter's that Paul, his fellow apostle, wrote, and I'm quoting from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, where Peter wrote, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Well, in light of our text today, Peter's assessment of Paul's letters makes me laugh, because as the old proverb says, it's like the pot calling the kettle black. In other words, Peter was equally guilty of the same thing he accused Paul of. Some of the things that he wrote in this passage are hard to understand. In fact, my wife told me yesterday when she read this passage in anticipation of the sermon this morning, she thought to herself, whoa, what does this mean? <laughs> Which is perhaps what some of you thought when we read it together this morning. In fact, my wife kindly reminded me today before I came here that if God could speak to a donkey that didn't have a clue what he was saying, then perhaps God could use me this morning to make this passage a little bit clearer to all of us um, than it might be. But we shouldn't feel too bad because when the great uh, learned Martin Luther put his comments regarding this, pas pay, pay, uh, this, this passage, he wrote a comment about it. He, this is all he said, and I quote, 
A wonderful text is this, and more obscure passage perhaps than any other in the New Testament, so that I do not know for a certainty just what Peter means. I cannot understand it, and I cannot explain it, end quote. Well, I agree with Luther. I cannot fully understand this, and I cannot fully explain this, but at the same time, it doesn't seem appropriate for me to skip over this passage and just kind of close in prayer and send you all home to figure it out on your own, and come back next week and tell me what you think. Well, the one thing I can promise you this morning is that while we won't be able to solve all the problems in these verses, I can try to help us see the main point of this passage and and draw out of it the practical encouragement that Peter intended for us to receive. I think we need to keep in mind as we go through these verses that Peter didn't write them to stump us or confuse us, but to stimulate us and to comfort us. And while we don't have time to cover all the possible ways to interpret these verses, I I can try to help us avoid, at least avoid, twisting this passage to make it say things that Peter didn't mean it to say and keep us from falling into some kind of doctrinal error. Some of these verses, as you can imagine, are used as proof texts for heretical beliefs such as purgatory or uh, baptismal regeneration. One of the basic principles of a, of a literal historical grammatical method of interpretation is never base a doctrine or belief on an unclear, obscure verse of Scripture. We need to let the clear verses help us interpret the, the less clear ones. And these verses were, no doubt, much clearer to those who first read them than they are to us today. But just because Peter made the questionable statement that baptism now saves shouldn't cause anyone to conclude that a person must be baptized in order to be saved since that would contradict so many other clearer verses in the Bible. For example, there are at least 150 passages in the New Testament which teach that salvation is by faith alone apart from any works which we can do, including baptism. And all these verses can't be trumped by just one or two verses that seem to teach that baptism is necessary for salvation. Besides, there's no record of Jesus ever personally baptizing anyone, which is strange if baptism is necessary for salvation. At the same time, he promised the thief on the cross that he would go immediately to heaven when he died and he never was baptized. Furthermore, Paul thanked God that he had baptized very few of the believers in Corinth because they were running around saying, well, I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Paul, and I'm of Cephas, I'm of Peter. And the most spiritual ones were saying, well, I'm of Christ. And so the fact that Paul baptized some showed that he practiced believers' baptism, but the fact that he baptized only a few shows that he didn't consider it a requirement for salvation. Well, I tackle that right off the bat because it's one of the most complicated, controversial subjects that we have to address in what is without question the most difficult passage to interpret in 1 Peter and some even say the entire New Testament. And working your way through this passage is like trying to find your way through a labyrinth filled with all sorts of exegetical options and interpretive decisions. But I think a good starting point is to to just rise above all the complexities, all the controversies, and and get a bird's eye view of this passage. In fact, one commentator I read avoided all the challenges by simply doing that. He just kind of gave a flyover so you could kind of see this passage from 30,000 feet, which I found very helpful, particularly when it comes to sorting out the minutia in these verses, which we must do on some level. And again, we won't have the time to go into all the various views and the the pros and cons of each view, but in the words of one of my favorite expositors and commentators, Chuck Swindoll, he said, it will help us untangle this text 
if we can isolate the central thread that forms the unifying theme of this passage. And so it's maybe best to start with the two clearest verses in this passage. The first one, verse 18, and the last one, verse 22. Verse 18, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Verse 22, again, talking about Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. So these two verses serve as the bookends of this text, and they are very clear, and they help us interpret the three not-so-clear verses that are in between them. And again, we need to remember the the context here. Peter was using the example of Jesus' unjust suffering on the cross and his ultimate vindication to encourage his readers to persevere in the midst of their suffering. Remember verse 17, for it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. And then he goes on to talk about Christ's death on the cross as the ultimate example of unjust suffering. But he wants us to see in this text that the victorious outcome of Christ's vicarious death, the vicarious death being in verse 18, the victorious outcome being in verse 22, should reassure us when we get falsely accused or unfairly persecuted, reminding us that our salvation is secure in Christ and we will experience the same glorious ending as Jesus experienced. Because in the end, he triumphed over the grave, he was resurrected, he was exalted to the right hand of God in heaven, where he sits as the sovereign Lord over all those who oppose us and oppress us. And as you read through these verses, it it, it seems that Peter may have been following the flow of an ancient hymn or creed that they used back then. Uh, Paul includes one of those in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it goes like this, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. So there's an obvious progression there in Paul's letter, um, and it seems like there's um, an obvious progression here uh, in Peter's words that I just really want to um, divide up into four simple sections. Uh, The crucifixion of Christ, verse 18, the proclamation of Christ, verses 19 and 20, the resurrection of Christ, verse 21, and the exaltation of Christ in verse 22. So let's look at these four simple, um, I guess, um, steps, if you will, in the life and ministry of Uh, of Jesus Christ. Number one, the crucifixion of Christ. Verse 18, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. I mentioned last week that everything else that is said in the rest of the passage is incidental to what he said in the first phrase of verse 18. Because here he provided with us, provided for us, one of the shortest, simplest riches richest summaries of the gospel in the entire Bible. And we can't let the rest of this text to cause, uh, cause us in any way to miss this or to minimize the, the clarity, the beauty of the gospel. And, and here we have the heart of the gospel, which is simply this, that God's sinless son died once for all in the place of sinful people to reconcile us to God. And again, as I mentioned last week, the word for there at the beginning of verse 18 indicates that Peter was giving a reason for or an example of what he was talking about in the previous verses. And Peter was already, has already been exhorting us to follow the example of Christ. He presented him as the best illustration of how we should respond to unjust suffering. But he also wanted to make sure it was clear that Jesus' death was not merely exemplary but expiatory. I used that $100 word last week. It it simply means that Christ's death atoned for or paid for our sin. 
And so when Jesus died on the cross, he wasn't just setting an example for us, he was saving us from execution by being executed in our place. And Peter went on here at the end of verse 18 to say, having been put to death in the flesh, Jesus experienced the most violent form of execution that that ended his earthly life. And Peter used the word flesh here to refer to Christ's humanity, which he took upon himself at the incarnation. John 1.14, 1 Timothy 3.16, Hebrews 5.7, even Philippians chapter 2 talks about how Jesus took on flesh, that he became a, a man. He didn't just look like a man, he was a man. 100% God, 100% man. And because he was a real man, he really died as a man. He didn't just pass out. Some of you may be familiar with the, what's called the swoon theory, that Jesus really didn't die on the cross. He just kind of lost consciousness, and they, they mistook the fact that he, you know, he passed out. He really didn't die, and they put him in the tomb, and the coolness of the tomb he, you know, revived him, brought him back to consciousness. He never really died. No, he, he actually died. Peter wants us to, to know that. He was put to death in the flesh, but at the same time, he was made alive in the Spirit. Some of your translations may read, by the Spirit, capital S, referring to the Holy Spirit. And while this is true, or it is true that Jesus was brought back to life by the power of the Holy Spirit, Scripture makes that undeniably clear, this is likely a reference to Jesus' inner spirit in contrast to his flesh or his body. And it seems to be a contrast there that Peter's making, having been put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit. You may remember when Jesus was on the cross, he cried out in the moment before he died. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my, what? My spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So while his physical body was dead or died and remained dead for three days, his eternal spirit remained alive. Now, at the same time, he did experience a kind of spiritual death, not a cessation of life, but a separation from God. And that is what he meant when he cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? One commentator described that statement with these words. He said, that utterance, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, reflected his temporary and humanly incomprehensible sense of alienation from the Father while God's full wrath and the burden of sinners' iniquities were placed on him and judged. For that brief time, Christ's experience paralleled the condition of unbelievers who live paradoxically in spiritual death in this life and face divine judgment in physical death. And Peter goes on to tell us that while Jesus' body lay in the tomb, he went in his spirit to proclaim to the spirits. Verse 19, this brings us to our second point, the proclamation of Christ. Notice it says, he was made alive in the spirit in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Now a number of questions should immediately come to your mind like, well, where did Christ go and who were these spirits and what did he say to them? And in light of the connection that Peter made to the days of Noah, which we need to read on, verse 20, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Because of that connection that Peter made to the days of Noah, there's a number of ways you could understand what he was saying. Some believe he was referring to the pre-incarnate ministry of Christ who preached through Noah, warning people in his day to repent before God flooded the earth. But they refused, and consequently they are now incarcerated in Hades. Their, their souls are in Hades awaiting their final judgment. Uh, those that believe that or take that interpretation will base it on chapter 1, verse 11, where... Uh, Peter 
commented how the prophets who prophesied in the Old Testament were doing so through the Spirit of Christ within them. And so they say, well, that's what ha- was happening. Jesus was preaching through, the Spirit of Christ was preaching through uh, Noah. Um, others, in similar fashion, say that these were the spirits or souls of the people who lived during the days of Noah, who refused to repent, and Jesus went and shared the gospel with them after he died and gave them a second chance at salvation. Hopefully you're already going to that view, right? That doesn't sound orthodox, does it? Well, I would propose to you that Peter was not referring to human beings here, but fallen angels, who, by the way, that word spirits is pretty much always used to describe the spirit realm, not human souls, talking about angelic spirits. And so these were, again, not human beings, but fallen angels who are permanently bound in the abyss or the pit because of their wickedness during the days of Noah. And that's what it goes on to say. They were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. So these fallen angels overstepped their bounds and were consigned to the pit, also known as Hades, which is sort of like a holding tank, if you will, that, that could be compared to being, on, being in a prison on death row where, where inmates are waiting to be executed. And so these fallen angels or demons are waiting in prison to be cast into the lake of fire along with Satan for all eternity. We know that that's going to happen based on Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, Revelation chapter 10, They're talking about the great white throne judgment when God will cast Satan and all of his minions and all of those who have rejected Christ into the lake of fire forever. Well, to better better understand who these fallen angels are and what they did to incur such a, a severe, solitary confinement by God, we need to look at a couple of other key cross references and Thankfully, two of them are right in the same neighborhood here. Look at 2 Peter. Just turn a page to the right. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. The book, of first, the book of 2 Peter is written to address false teaching and false teachers and, and what God thinks of them and what God will do to them. And notice in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, he says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So notice again, he's making the connection between these angels who sinned and were committed to the pits of darkness um, reserved for judgment, awaiting judgment during the, it seems at the same period of time, there as Noah. Uh, Then look over to Jude, just a couple more pages to the right, the book of Jude, which also is written to address false teaching, false teachers. Jude chapter 6, or excuse me, chapter 6, Jude 6, only one chapter, Jude 6, and the angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, He is kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So what does it mean that these angels, they didn't keep their own domain, they abandoned their proper abode? It seems like they're the same angels because they're being kept in eternal bonds, um, awaiting their judgment. Well, the next verse gives us some insight, perhaps. He says, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these, these angels, indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Well, that becomes a little clear. We know what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah when those two angelic visitors uh, came to stay with Lot and to warn him about the coming judgment, the wicked homosexuals in the, the uh, city of Sodom and Gomorrah tried to have sex with these angelic beings. 
And so it seems that that was the same thing that the angels did. Verse 6, they didn't keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode. They, they went after strange flesh, if you will. There's one more passage that kind of pulls this all together, and that's all the way back in Genesis. Genesis chapter 6. I want to invite you to turn there as well. Genesis chapter 6. And this is how Moses recorded what, the, what was going on on the earth right before God decided to destroy the, the earth with a flood. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, now it came about when men began to multiply in the face of the land and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, by the way, the, the phrase the sons of God is a reference in the Old Testament to angels, to angelic beings, not human beings, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. In other words, uh, they got 120 years to repent. It's about the time it took for Noah to build the ark. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals, to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So you're like, what is going on here? Well, apparently these fallen angels had sexual relations with women or perhaps they possessed men who had sexual relations with women which produced a race of giants called the Nephilim, thus polluting or contaminating or adulterating the human bloodline. And this may have been a satanic attempt to prevent the coming of the Messiah by making it impossible for that sinless seed of the woman to be born. Genesis 3.15, uh, God, God had promised uh, Satan that, that there was going to be, the woman would bear a child and, and, and that child would crush, that crush Satan's head. Um, so this could have been just one of many ways that Satan and his minions uh, tried to thwart God's plan of salvation. And so... When Christ died, these fallen angels who are incarcerated somewhere um, in this pit, in this abyss, in this holding tank, waiting, awaiting their eternal doom in hell, um, and again, not all the demons are there. I mean, this is a, a, a special, a select group of demons who did what, whatever they did back in Genesis chapter 6. And, and so the other ones are running around still, right? There's lots of fallen angels. Satan and his minions are, are roaming the earth and, 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 and doing all sorts of wicked things to undermine the work of God. And so perhaps after those free demons, if you will, incited the Jews to crucify Jesus, this particular batch of fallen angels that were in the, you know, whatever, the, 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 uh, the crowd, if you will, they kind of in their little box seats to watching what was going on from, from the pit, uh, they may have been celebrating their, their, um, what their fellow demons had accomplished, an apparent victory, when to their shock, the living Christ showed up and wrecked their party by announcing that he had triumphed over them. And the word proclaim here that, that Peter uses is not the word for evangelize, but to herald. And I think this is important to note because in the ancient world, heralds would go to a city to make a public announcement, often before the victory procession of a general or a king who was celebrating a, a recent military triumph. Uh, 
And so Jesus was not offering them a second chance at salvation. He was heralding his victory over them along with the, the power of sin and death and hell, which, re, which would ultimately result in their ultimate eternal doom. Again, Chuck Swindoll states this. He says it this way. This proclamation caused the demons to realize that their work had been in vain and that all of their attempts to sabotage our salvation through the cross were nullified. And so we have this verse here in 1 Peter 3, you've got Ephesians 4, 8, talking about Christ descending to the depths. You have Colossians chapter 2, uh, verse 15, which talks about uh, how he, um, uh, it says he had disarmed the rulers and authorities. He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. You've got these verses um, that, that really are the basis for that, that dubious line in the Apostles' Creed, which states that Christ, remember it? What does it say? descended into hell. I don't know if you've ever read the Apostles' Creed, but you go, when I, whenever I get to that, I'm like, what do they mean by that? And if what they meant by that is that Jesus, or what you mean by that is that Jesus went to hell for those three days between his crucifixion and resurrection, and he got beat up and, and kicked around by Satan and experienced what hell was like, um, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. You've got to read that into the scripture. That's just not there. But if by descended into hell, you mean he went there to declare victory over death, Satan, and hell, then I'm good with descended into hell. Um, notice that last phrase in verse 20. He says, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. I mean, this is astounding to think about. That perhaps there was millions of people already populating the earth before the flood, and yet sin was so rampant and the demonic influence was so strong in the days leading up to the flood that even after Noah pleaded with people to repent for 120 years, the only people who responded were his wife and three sons and his three daughter-in-laws. I mean, after 120 years of, of preaching, all he could show for was, was, was eight converts. And you can imagine how Noah was the laughing stock of his generation, building a boat in the middle of the desert in preparation for a flood, even though it had never rained before. May I remind you that Jesus foretold that before his return, the world would be like it was in the days of Noah. And I think this is just a good reminder for us as Christians that like Noah and his family, we are a small persecuted minority living as aliens and exiles in a godless world that mocks us and thinks we're fools. And as we see society decaying around us and depravity becoming more Man's depravity becoming more rampant and we sense the opposition to Christ and his people increasing. We need to remember that we will ultimately be delivered just like Noah and his family. And even more importantly, this whole ark thing is a beautiful, powerful analogy of salvation. The ark, I don't know if you know this, but the, the ark was intended to be a, a type or a foreshadowing of the salvation that God would provide for his people in Christ. The ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. The floodwaters depict God's judgment, and the only people who survived the flood were those inside the ark. And similarly, the only people who will survive the flood of God's wrath are those who are in Christ. Why? Because Christ bore the full fury of God's wrath against sin when he hung on the cross in our place. 
And so I ask you before we move on, have you given up your sin and gotten on the ark? Have you repented and are you taking refuge in Christ? If you haven't yet, maybe you're still on the outside making fun of the Noahs in your life, the Christians in your life, thinking they're kind of kooky, kind of crazy. You need to realize that God is showing the same kind of patience towards you that he did to the people during the days of Noah. Listen to what Peter will say in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 6, talking about how the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water, but by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. If you remember, Jesus promised after the flood, after Noah and and his family came out of the ark, there was a rainbow, and that was a promise, a covenant, that he would never destroy the earth with water ever again. But he didn't say anything about fire. That's next on God's agenda. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness. In other words, don't sit around and go, yeah, the pastor, and he, the preacher has always been telling me Jesus is coming back. Yeah, whatever. Uh, it's been 2,000 years. Come on. Well, God's timetable is different than ours. He's not slow in keeping his promise to return, but instead is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And one of the reasons why Jesus has not returned yet and destroyed this world with fire is because some of you need to repent. Some of your family members need to repent. God's being patient with them and giving you more opportunities to share Christ with them. Same with your neighbors and your coworkers, your classmates, right? He's being patient with them. And so let's be faithful ambassadors for Christ in these days when God is showing his patience towards folks. Well, that's the proclamation. Let's look at the resurrection of Christ, verse 21. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Corresponding to what? To the fact that eight persons were brought safely through the water in other words, the eight people in the ark were saved from God's judgment is, is similar to believers being saved from eternal damnation by virtue of being in Christ. It was through the ark that they were saved. It's through Christ that we are saved. He says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Now, I think it's important to, to, to consider what Peter was not saying before we consider what he was saying, I don't think Peter was referring to being immersed in water, but being immersed in Christ. The, the word baptism, by the way, simply means immersion. It could be in water, it could be in Christ, but the idea here is, is baptism represents, baptism by immersion represents our immersion in Christ. The, the Bible talks about being baptized into Christ also referred to as being baptized by the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we are all made to drink of one spirit, Romans chapter 6, verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So water baptism, what we're going to experience next Sunday night, merely symbolizes or illustrates what happens when a person gets saved. They die and they're buried and they're raised to walk in newness of life. So baptism is simply an outward demonstration of an inward decision that we made 
to trust in Christ alone for our salvation. In other words, when we get baptized, we're not getting saved. We're just publicly acknowledging the fact that we are saved. And in the same way, the floodwaters didn't save Noah. Quite the opposite. In fact, the floodwaters destroyed everyone around Noah. They, they were a tool of God's judgment, not the means of salvation. Noah and his family were saved from the waters, not through the waters. So the waters of baptism don't save us. They, they simply picture our salvation. And in order to make sure that no one misunderstood what he meant when he said baptism now saves you, Peter clearly affirmed that he wasn't talking about water baptism. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh. In other words, baptism doesn't wash away your sins. Our sins are washed away by Christ's blood when we turn to him in repentant faith. He says, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. What provides a person who is living a sinful lifestyle, a clear conscience is not some external ritual or ceremonial cleansing, but acknowledging their sin and asking God to forgive them based on the blood of Christ. Hebrews 9, 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hebrews 10, 22, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. That word appeal there has the idea of a pledge or some kind of covenant that you might make, one might make. Peter could have been reminding his readers here of what they had confessed or committed to at their baptism. In other words, they had gotten up and they, they had agreed in front of you know, all of their fellow believers that they were going to make a break with their own sinful way of life and they were going to follow and obey and serve Jesus Christ. John MacArthur, I think, brilliantly describes this whole concept of appeal, an appeal to God for a good conscience. He said this, quote, appeal is, is a technical term that was used in making contracts. Here it refers to agreeing to meet certain divinely required conditions before God places one into the ark of safety. Anyone who would be saved must first come to God with a desire to obtain a good conscience and a willingness to meet the conditions necessary to obtain it. By appealing to God for a conscience free from accusation and condemnation, the unregenerate show they are tired of the sin that dominates them and desire to be delivered from its burden of guilt and the threat of hell. They crave the spiritual cleansing that comes through Christ's shed blood. Therefore, they repent of their sins and plea for God's forgiveness and the removal of the guilt that plagues their consciences, all of which is available through trusting in the atoning sacrifice of Christ. What a great description of what it means to be a Christian. What does it mean to truly come to know Jesus Christ? Which, by the way, is all based on the resurrection. Notice the last phrase there, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ's resurrection verified or proved that God had accepted his sacrifice in our place and his wrath and justice had been fully satisfied by his sinless life and his sacrificial death. So our salvation is, is sealed and secured through the resurrection of Jesus. It wasn't enough for Jesus to die. He also had to rise again. And then lastly, verse 22, we'll just call this the exaltation of Christ. The exaltation of Christ. After Christ was resurrected, he ascended back to heaven, which, by the way, Peter saw with his own eyes and was exalted to the place of supreme power and prominence. Notice he says, who is at the right hand of God, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. That little phrase, at the right hand of God, is symbolic of a position of power, a position of preeminence. 
Psalm 110.1, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Romans 8.34, Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he has put all things in subjection under his feet. And then Hebrews 8.1, we have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Beloved, we may never know, based on this passage, where Jesus went after he died, who he talked to, what he said, but we can know for sure where he is now. And what he is saying to us in this text. And based on what Christ experienced, exiles, strangers, aliens, sojourners like Noah and like us who faithfully follow Christ on our journey to heaven will make it through the waters of this life and arrive safely and triumphantly on the shores of eternity. And we should draw comfort and courage from knowing that if we suffer for him, we will also be glorified like him. Romans 8, verse 17, we are fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. In other words, whatever we have to endure here on earth doesn't even begin to compare with what we'll experience in heaven someday. They're momentary, light afflictions, Paul says, and they're producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. And maybe one more thing. We have no need to fear the ferocity of men or the fury of Satan because God is sovereign over both of them. And they can't do anything that he hasn't ordained. And so to know that Jesus is Lord of all is one of the greatest encouragements for us as Christians, especially when we're being assaulted by Satan and his forces or we're being mocked or or maligned or mistreated by our fellow human beings. And, And even if we're martyred, you think of Stephen In Acts chapter 7, he was preaching the gospel to his fellow Jews and they they were so infuriated, they stuck their fingers in their ears because they didn't want to hear it. And they picked up stones and they began to stone him to death. And as he was passing out of consciousness, he looked into the heavens and it says that he saw Christ not seated at the right hand of God, but standing at the right hand of God. It's as if Jesus stood up to welcome this faithful martyr into heaven. Stephen closed his eyes on this earth and opened them in heaven and there was Christ ready to receive him and reward him. And that's exactly what's gonna happen to us when we close our eyes here on this earth. We will wake up in heaven and we'll be staring Jesus in the face. And he will receive us And he will reward us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. God, thank you for always leading us in triumph in Christ and manifesting through us that sweet aroma of the knowledge of Christ in every place. I pray that you would help us to be a pleasant aroma to one another and even to those who are perishing this week as we go out into this world, there would be something about us that, that, that draws them to us and ultimately to Christ. And so, Lord, would you maybe sort out any other questions or issues that we have in our minds regarding this text? And if, if nothing else, Lord, thank you for humbling us before this text, recognizing that we're so finite when it comes to understanding you and your word at times.
And so I just pray that this would just drive us uh, to greater dependence upon you as we seek to understand your word and live your word in this world in which we live. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.